Firstly, it's, it's an honor, Sadhguru, to be sitting here in front of you and uh, being able to have a conversation with you. So thank you so much mm -hmm. uh, for this opportunity. And good evening to one and all here. Uh, I have to admit that this is the first time I feel stage fear. <laughs> I've never been camera conscious. I've never had stage fear, even in school. But I was just... Uh, hoping that I don't get over mesmerized and just don't forget the things that I have in my... I'll be looking away. Yes, please. <laughs> and, and the questions that I have in my mind. So, uh, shall we begin? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, so, I was told that my topic or uh, what we talk about is mission life today. And when I think of life, the first thing that comes to my mind is that life begins right in the womb of the mother, right? And each one of us takes birth in different kind of families, some poor, some very rich families. And they say that it's your past life that determines that. So what is that? What is your view on past life? And is it possible for every person to kind of get to know what their past was? Now, uh, it is true that if you… Uh, those who have more than one children, one child, I'm sorry, would know this if they paid attention. But otherwise, you can go to a hospital, watch ten, ten children who are just born. You will see these ten children are not same, they're just born, but they're not same. Each one of them have their own characteristic. Even if two children have come of the same parents, you have a sibling? Yes, I have a younger brother. Nothing like you? No, we are poles apart <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, though same genetics, same home, same food, probably same school many times, but so different. So obviously, from this we can assume there is some other data, though genetic data is same, atmosphere is same, everything else, all the inputs are same, but there is some other data which is making you so different from your sibling, which is in every home, it is true, very rare that two siblings are of similar nature. So obviously there is some other information which is making one person so different from the other. See, what makes you very different from another person is essentially what you remember, isn't it? Suppose I wiped out your memory and I wiped out another person's memory totally, both of them would act about similar. Only because you have a memory, it is so different. Now when we say memory, what you know as conscious memory is only a very small part of the memory. Do you… Do you remember how your great-great-great-great-great-grandmother looked like? No, her nose is sitting on your face though, isn't it? Yeah. Your body remembers. This body remembers so much that you cannot even imagine that much it remembers. So you can say this is just genetic. It is not just genetic. There are eight forms of memory. 
these eight forms of memory in the yogic way of looking at things, we say this is elemental memory, atomic memory, karmic memory, genetic memory and articulate memory, inarticulate memory and conscious and unconscious levels of memory, so eight forms of memory. You are normally conscious of only an extremely small part of your memory. How your forefathers were a million years ago, still even your skin remembers what should be the tone, isn't it? Nothing forgotten. So there is a, a tremendous amount of memory here. So what you're calling as karma, what you're calling as past life, there is memory. Past life is memory, isn't it? Right now what happened yesterday is only in your memory, it's not hanging anywhere here. So does life go beyond the birth of this body? Definitely it does, but I don't want you to believe such things. Because the moment you believe such things, you start imagining things. This is uh, gone crazy, particularly in United States, anybody who sees, if they like this person, oh, maybe our past life. <laughs> Three days of romance and then they realize there's no future. Right, right. So, if you start believing these things, your imagination will fly, it's no good. But if you access these dimensions, then it transforms you in a completely different way. Is it necessary for every human being to access these memories? Not necessary, because most people cannot handle the memory of this life, they're freaking. Yes? True that, true that. Ten, twenty years of memory, they cannot handle it. If you remind them of ten lifetimes of memory, what will happen to them? They better not remember. Anyway, a whole lot of things are being done in the… you know, all imported from United States largely about past life regressions Regression. and this and that. These are just psychological processes. With psychological process, if you go to a certain level, essentially you're going into analyzing yourself. With this analysis, you could come to some conclusion, some imagery, whatever. Through psychological processes, you can never ever break through the barrier of memory which separates you from one life to another. Something deeper than your psychological structure has to be activated for you to know that. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. But what is the purpose? Now there are some people uh, on, on purpose now, it's said, I don't know how much or to what extent it's right, uh, that certain people have patterns in their life, you know, um, of say failure on work front or be it relationships or, or just they're, they're lucky with certain things, unlucky and then they're directed towards a direction that maybe, you know, you've got some thing from your past life hanging on and that's why they go into regression uh, to kind of clear out those layers and auras is what I've heard. So how much is that true? See, essentially what you're saying is certain things going wrong in this life means you are in some way incapable of handling this life. Now I will hand you one, over li one, one more lifetime to you, will you handle it properly? No, <laughs> that's definitely not the reason why you go there. Sometimes for spiritual reasons, to enhance certain dimensions, we do break through those things, but uh, that is not at all needed for most people because their lives will get totally, totally disturbed by this. I'm just saying for example, it so happened, Let's say you're walking on the street and uh, <laughs> I'm just making this frivolous, okay <laughs> You're walking on the street and you saw a street dog and you remembered, oh, this was my brother in my past life and you ran after the street dog, but the dog doesn't remember <laughs> You know what'll happen <laughs> So you should not believe these things. But does it exist? Definitely it exists. So the attitude that you must take is you do not believe these things, but you do not disbelieve these things. You don't you mind. Cl no. You clearly understand life is much more than what you think. So there could be any number of possibilities. If you want to explore, if you're interested, I can give you a method how to explore. 
But just believing something, because somebody says in your past life you were this, you were that, this will only destroy the present life because you will go from reality to hallucination. But as long as it's just to get an idea, just for fun, inquisitiveness sake, then it's fine <laughs> <laughs> No, it can no. get you into serious trouble. Right. But then you do agree that there are soul connections, like the souls remain the same around. I mean, that's what I've heard, that people say that your family or your which, near and dear which ones… Which one are you talking about, the right one or the left one? The souls? Yeah. Well, both. They were together in the past life, so, <laughs> so I'm talking about both together. So you already <laughs> found your soulmate, huh? Right. I think only in my slippers I found my soulmate. <laughs> so does that happen? Like they say that your friends or your families or, you know, from your past lives to now, they remain the same or the souls around you are the same or maybe in form of your friends. Uh. I would advise people to make new and numerous and new friendships. Now, even for lifetimes, if you can't make new friends and the same idiots are going with you every lifetime, That's really sad. you must be in a <laughs> terrible condition. Yeah. I know you come from a, a profession where people used to sing Janam Janam all the time, but not anymore. <laughs> no, 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 we just make them believe on screen, trust me. Not anymore, right? No, only on screen, only we still make them believe. Only in seventies, Janam Janam happened, not anymore. Even now we dance around the trees and make them believe that that exists, but <laughs> the reality is quite different. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, you know, karma is, is something that's always been a very intriguing factor for me because you say what goes around comes around and you know you your karma comes right in front of you still I always feel that in a country like ours there is so much that people get away with you know in terms of corruption in terms of crime or power takes over where does karma come in is karma limited to only poor people and and it doesn't apply for the rich or the powerful? <laughs> See, this is a very, unfortunately, a simplistic representation. You are suffering, so it's your karma. I think uh, if somebody is suffering, to tell him it's your karma, so you are suffering, is not some great insight into karmic substance of that person. It's just that you lack humanity. You're going through something painful, I say, oh, it's your karma. This is lack of humanity, not some insight into life or <laughs> such. Let's understand what is karma. See, the way you understand, the way you perceive, experience, understand anything that comes your way depends on the past memory that you have. For example, what kind of music do you like? Anything that's soothing to the ears. Heavy metal? No, not at all soothing to the ears. <laughs> okay. So you want some soothing music. So if you play heavy metal music for you, and this music can be only played at full volume, anything less than that it doesn't work. So if you play heavy metal music for you at full volume, you will have a nervous breakdown. But there is some young people there, they are… <laughs> same sound. In one people's… in one person's <coughs> ears, it becomes music, for another person it's noise. So, how you recognize a particular sound, this is your karma. This is why in this country we told you, when we say karma, we did not say that you need to be punished, you're suffering, you're being punished. This is not the karma… karma aspect. Karma means action. We are performing four dimensions of action right now as you sit here. Physical action is happening, mental action is happening, they are saying you're very brainy. <laughs> They're putting pressure on me <laughs> <laughs> Emotional action is happening, energy action is happening. These four dimensions of activity, today, from the moment you woke up till this moment, how much of these four karmas are you conscious? 
I guess the physical uh, karma, because your act, physical action and the mental action. To what extent are you conscious? Don't calculate, I'm telling you, know. it's well below one percent. I'm sure, I'm sure. So, when only one percent of your activity is conscious, your life is accidental, that's what it means. Let's say you drive on the street. You drive for ten minutes on the Vishakapatnam streets, they're not too bad. They're very good. Roads are good and traffic is better than most of the places <laughs> In this city, you drive for ten minutes and for only one percent of the time you keep your eyes open, rest of the time you drive with your eyes closed. It's accident, not accidental <laughs> <laughs> No, sometimes people are compassionate, they may make way for you. So, it's not accidental, it's an accident, it's going to be a crash <laughs> Yes. So that is what is happening with life. This is why so much stress, so much fear, because largely it is happening unconsciously. What you're doing, what your body is doing, what your energies are doing, what your thought is doing, emotion is doing, very small speck people are conscious of, rest is unconscious. If you do… if you increase the size of what is conscious, suddenly it feels like everything is in your hands. If you can consciously conduct your body in every way, fifteen to twenty percent of your life and destiny will be in your hands. If you can consciously conduct the thought process, forty to fifty percent, along with thought, emotion also, if you conduct it consciously, anywhere between forty to seventy percent of your life will be… life and destiny will be in your hands. If you can conduct your very life energies consciously, one hundred percent of your life and destiny will happen the way you want it. If you become available to a dimension of intelligence within you, which is beyond you, which is… we call it chitta, you can call it grace, you can call it whatever. If you become available to grace, you not only are in charge of your life and your destiny, you can also take charge of the life and destiny of a million people around you. This is available to a human being. Will a human being explore these dimensions or do they want to be just eat, sleep, reproduce and die one day? It's up to them. But no matter who you are, what kind of work you do, how much money you have, what you do, you can try to forget it, but mortality is hanging in your face, isn't it? Most people don't get it unless a doctor gives them a terrible diagnosis or they get very old. But isn't it true? As you inhale and exhale, if the next inhalation doesn't come in, you're gone, poof. So fragile this life is, at the same time it's so sturdy how many things a man can do, but woof, it'll be gone. When we are here, <laughs> we think we are everything. What we don't understand is, as you sit here right now, Countless number of people have walked and sat on this planet like you and me. Where are they? All topsoil? The windmill uh, particles. Huh? The windmill particles which yes. just… Unless… This will also become topsoil. Unless somebody chooses to bury you real deep, fearing you may raise from the dead. <laughs> you know, there have been instances… Yeah. <laughs> Can I tell you a joke? Can I tell you a joke? Yes, please <laughs> This happened. There was a couple in Texas over seventy years of age. It was their fortieth wedding anniversary also. They've been planning, they've been always wanting to go to the holy land of the Jerusalem. But being in business, children, this, that, they never made it. Over seventy years of age, now they got the opportunity. Both of them went. They were overwhelmed by the whole situation there, they walked the streets, they walked in the street where Jesus is supposed to have walked. 
You know, Jerusalem reeks of history. Every stone, every cobblestone reeks of history. Then they went to that place where Jesus is supposed to have walked upon water. They were completely overwhelmed, thoroughly enjoying their trip. But unfortunately, the lady had a heart attack and she died. You know it happens. Then he was making preparations to take the body back to Texas. Then the local people approached and said, see, this is not a bad thing. Your wife has died in the holy land. This is the place to die. So there is no need to go to Texas and above all, it costs you eighteen thousand dollars to transport your wife's body to Texas. We will do it here. Eighteen thousand dollars plus local charges there. So for you, a special price because you are from Texas, twenty thousand dollars, we'll do everything. The man thought about it and said, no, I will take her to Texas. They said, no, 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 you are under stress, you know. Please don't uh, torture the child, whoever. <laughs> He's just started his life, uh, he doesn't want to know about past life and <laughs> Or too much karma <laughs> So, uh, $20,000. $20, then they said, you are under stress, you are not able to think clearly, we will give you a discount, fifteen thousand dollars. Let's do it. The man thought about it and said, no, I will take her to Texas. They said, no, 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 you are under duress, you are not able to see things clearly. What is the point? This is the place to die, Jerusalem, this is the holy land, she wanted to come here and she died here. This is where it must happen. You are under a deep stress, so because of your distress and suffering, we will give you a super discount, ten thousand dollars, let's do it. You know, this is Jerusalem, you can bargain <laughs> The man thought about it and he said, no, I'm taking her to Texas. Then they said, why? It doesn't make sense. Why are you doing this? The man said, <clears throat> in Texas, dead stay dead. In <laughs> Well, he didn't want to risk it. <laughs> So, we are sitting here right now. We will fall dead and become part of this earth. Somebody else will be walking over it in no time. It's a brief life, it's a very brief life. Especially if you're joyful, it's a very, very brief life. Have you noticed this on a particular day? Yeah, happy days just pass Happy days just like go this. like a moment, miserable days take a long time. It so only miserable people can have a long life. <laughs> if you're joyful, before you know what hit you, it gets over. So in this brief life, is it not important that extremely brief life, for the immensity of what a human being can be, this time that's allotted for us is too, too little. But in that people get bored and they kill themselves. Very unfortunate. Without ever exploring the nature of what this life is about, simply because people's physiological and psychological drama has bigger than the existential realities in which we are. But that's also because, Sadhguru, a lot of them are not aware of what the reality is. That's because they don't know how to act in their life <laughs> No, they're, they're thinking it's real, you need to tell them. Right, like you're showing them a path, you know, and no, no, you is a need great to tell them it's all an act. <laughs> well, unfortunately, somehow I feel a large percentage in our country is still struggling for the basics, you know, which is the food and the shelter and home and clothes. So for them, that is it, that meeting their ends is, is tougher. That so, is an unfortunate reality. Still, basics like food and shelter have not happened. Right. That's a different thing. But, Believe me, those who are successful are suffering a lot more than those who are not so successful. 
you… Uh, <laughs> I'm constantly working with business leaders around the world and I see most successful people have the longest faces. I agree. <laughs> I don't know what makes it so difficult to just put a smile on your face all through the day <laughs> So, if people don't have anything to eat, that's a different situation, we have to yeah. fix that, there's no question about that. But people's psychological drama, what you think and feel becomes bigger than the creation. True. Because of that, life gets all messed up. After all, it's your thought, you can make it any way you want it. After all, it's your emotion, you can make it any way you want it. But that freedom and that awareness is not there simply because less than one percent of it is conscious. Rest is all in reaction to something else. So now, now you said, you know, most of it is we're not conscious about the actions. And coming back to my question where my main point was, what if it's a consciously bad karma that a person does, you know, say, say a murderer or somebody who commits crimes or, you know, there's so much, so much happening in our country today. Now, where does karma fall in place? Because my question was, in at least our country, it's not like the Middle East where people are h highly punished. There's a lot that you can get away with. Um, because where does... a lot of times, just the way they're living itself is a punishment. <laughs> so, we don't think we have to punish them further. No, but, but there are quite a lot. I mean, we, we all know that, you know, there are people who get away with a lot of things and, and uh, very unfortunate that it is. But does, is, it, is it somehow, somewhere that we're not able to handle things properly in our country and we blame it on karma? See, it's not just in this country, everywhere it is there. Here we have over ten thousand years of uh, culture and history, so we have learned many more tricks <laughs> We have learned many more tricks as to how to do these things. Essentially, karma means action, as I said, four dimensions of action. In the physical world, action naturally has a consequence. It is not like somebody is sitting up there and they're going to punish you for this or that. You said if a consciously negative karma… See, what is negative and positive is not in the action, it is in the volition, it's in the intention. I'm sorry to take such an example, but uh, you come from an army setup, right. your family is there. Armed forces means we have built armed forces mainly so that if somebody bothers us to kill them. Nothing wrong with that, you get a medal for that because we are doing it for a cause that we believe is sacred for us. But we must understand somebody else unfortunately believes their cause is also sacred. So don't take karma there because there are many people who believe what they are doing is God's own work and they're willing to die for it. But it's against us, so we don't like it. Well, we didn't start the problem, that's our argument. That is at the level of political, social situations, yes. But now you're talking about an inner situation. An inner situation is only by intention. Intention is fixed, everybody thinks what they're doing is great. If you and me were two different countries, I'm fighting for my country, you're fighting for your country, so <laughs> Right. Now, now coming to intention, you know, um, like you say that your thought is something that when you give it out to the universe, like the law of attraction, the ask… <laughs> You've been uh, reading all these American books <laughs> <laughs> I've been… I've read Inner Engineering as well, but uh, the, so, so, so it just makes me uh, curious about these things. When you say the law of attraction where you ask, believe and receive, anything that is sent out to the universe in a positive direction or in a constant direction rather, happens, you know, because they say that you design your destiny, you design your life, like you just happen to say that, you know, you, you, your conscious efforts, you can have control over your life. Now, coming to intentions, now what if someone's, I mean, you're sending out a positive signal, great, 
What if someone is… No, I did not agree with that. You made a theory. There are <laughs> lots of holes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, well, my question, you did not agree to it. So, my question is, um, if someone is sending out… Okay, you want your life to be a certain way, you, you send out positive signals, which is great. But… To whom? To the universe. To the universe. Which See? direction? Up or down? <laughs> That's what I'm asking. How does the law of attraction work? Does it really work? It doesn't work. It doesn't work? <laughs> so what works? How do you design your Law of attraction is something that happens between opposites. <laughs> yes? <laughs> Whether two magnets or two, you know, uh, two opposites, male and, male and female or whichever way, law of attraction is always between opposites, isn't it? From North Pole to South Pole to this and that, it is working like that. Right. Now you're talking about the universe, so that means you are an alien to this universe? Part of the universe. If it's part of the universe, what is there to be attracted about? Well, how… why do they say that you can design your own destiny? You can. You can determine your destiny, you should. That's what being human means. Right. See, if you had come here like any other creature on this planet, they have compulsive cycles. They live by that, it's okay for them because that's all they're capable of. Once you have come as a human being, everything that you can do, actually if you look at your life, you're not doing anything very greatly different from what the other creatures are doing. They are born, you are born, you grow up, they grow up, they, re they reproduce, you reproduce, they die, you die. Nothing very different, but these same simple things, we can conduct them consciously. That is the significant thing about being human. The moment you conduct it, let's say you conduct your hand consciously, now this hand will do what you want, isn't it? You won't simply sit here and do like this. Now this will hand will do what you want. Suppose you conduct your thought consciously, now your thought will do what you want. If your thought was doing what you want, how would you keep yourself blissful or miserable? Blissful. blissful. Yeah. If you are blissful, would you go in search of happiness? Of course. Huh? No, if you are blissful, you are just if satisfied If you are blissful, would your life be in pursuit of happiness, I'm asking? It'll… you'll be in a state of… Yes, you are blissful. Yeah. So these things that people think are the greatest things in their life to be peaceful, joyful, nonsense wouldn't mean a thing to you because you are blissful. But you can't say that to them, they'll feel insulted. You have to… You have to play the tunes. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, if your thought and emotion was taking instructions from you, you would keep yourself in the highest level of pleasantness, whatever that is, isn't it? Correct. Yes. If that happened, if that happened, your entire life process will come to an ease, total ease. Right now this is because you have to… you're a crouching tiger. You have to go get something, always. There is nothing to get, if you sit here your life is complete. Now it's at ease, total ease. When it's in this kind of ease, it will become perceptive. Now, just pursuing a profession, making money or even being joyful or being loving or falling in love, nothing means anything to you because just sitting here, the highest level of pleasantness is happening to you. So what would you do with that life? Naturally, you would explore something that is not in your perception right now. This is how spiritual process begins. This is how you take charge of your life. Now you wish for something, it happened. I want you to know this, for most people, at least fifty percent of what they wish happens. It is just that, they are focusing on a few things that did not happen. If you want to be fair, in a reasonably well-settled society, ninety percent of what they wish happens, it is the ten percent they're complaining about. Yeah. Hello? Isn't it so? Yeah. Ninety percent of your life is happening the way you want it. The ten percent you're cribbing, you're never enjoying the ninety percent because this ten percent did not happen the way you want it. Yeah. <laughs> So already, to a large extent, you're in control of your destiny. 
a little is going off, but that little can bother you. It's like you drove hundred kilometers properly. Let's say you have to drive hundred kilometers. Ninety kilometers you went properly where you want to go, at the ninety-first kilometer you crashed. Still it's not good, isn't it? Yeah. So that's why they're complaining. I'm not saying they're complaining for nothing. Because at ninety kilometers everything went well, just before reaching something crashed. So they still suffer for that. Now, right now this is because situations are happening around us. Not all situations will ever happen the way we want it. Because situation is not just me. Situation is so many people involved, so many forces involved. All of them need not happen my way. But if I am happening my way, I am blissful, okay? Whether the golf ball flies straight or goes into the mountains, I am still blissful. <laughs> as long as you're playing golf. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I'm not playing. <laughs> right. So, so now coming to this, now as long as things happen your way and you're on your own path and you're blissful and you know… No, 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 no. I'm not saying as long as things happen your way, you will be blissful. If no, you're blissful, things will it happen. doesn't matter which way it happens. Right. Whichever way it happens, you're blissful. Right. <laughs> See, this is essentially the world has put cart before the horse. You tell me, it's, it is easier to take charge of yourself or it's easier to take charge of all these people? Of… I mean, it's tougher to take charge of yourself, you know. Oh, you can take charge of these people, try. No, because people… No, 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 because I, I… why I'm saying that is because people don't realize that they need to take charge of themselves and are out there to take charge of societies and communities and people and trying to change others. No, right now, you're sitting here. To myself. Is it easier to take charge of yourself or take charge of all these people? Myself. Yourself. You must first do that, no? What is simple and easy? If you take charge of yourself, let us see how much we can get cooperation from these people. Now, when you say you're in pursuit of happiness, what this means is, you want all of them to function the way you want. Then you will be happy. Now when we say, if this happens, I will be happy, if that happens, I will be happy, what it means is, the world should function, the universe should respond your way. That's not what I'm saying, no. I… I don't believe in that because that's trying to put conditionality into everything that, you know, this is how it should function according to me. What I… what I was saying was that, say, Okay, for example, a very basic example of somebody wants to be an actor or somebody wants to be a cricketer and I'm taking a ba very basic example of what you want to do in life and you work… Let's say it did not happen. It did not happen means what? People did not like your acting or uh, the selectors did not like your cricket, something happened. Right. So what you want did not happen. Can you still, still sit here blissfully? That's a question. Not a lot of people. That is can. why I'm saying what you're trying to do is when you say, everybody should like what I am doing, in some way you have to take charge of their minds, that's what you're doing. In some way through your cinema or whatever, in some way you're taking charge of their mind and doing what appeals to them and that's why it's working, isn't it? Otherwise it won't be working. Right. So, which is easier, taking charge of this or taking charge of them? This. If you take charge of this, now you are not in pursuit of your happiness, you are not tense about anything, there is no, pr you know, sword hanging on your head, you will do everything to the fullest to the hilt because you don't care what happens. Whatever happens, you will be still fine, this much you know. Now you will naturally do everything wonderfully well because there's absolutely no concern because you're not a vested interest anymore. You will do what is needed without any effort. So. What somebody thinks is a great circus and a feat, you will do it joyfully, playfully. Right. right. So, well, you just completely negated the fact that there's no law of attraction. There is nothing no, like there that. there is. I'm sure a lot of people are attracted to you <laughs> <laughs> Not that law of attraction <laughs> of, of, of the universe gives you what you want. But anyways, um, uh, no. where is the universe, I'm asking? Right here, we are a part of the universe. We… we… When Adi Yogi was asked by the seven sages who are today known as the Saptarishis, they asked, 
where does the universe begin, where does it end, how big is it, what is it? So he laughed and said, I can pack your entire cosmos into your mustard seed. That's a very efficient packing, isn't it? Very, very. <laughs> <laughs> so, because what you think is time and space is because of the nature of your mind. What is there? If you transcend the limitations of your own logical mind, what is there is here, what is here is there, what is then is now, what is now is then, everything, time and space gets all mixed up in your perception. Right. So when this happens, now you won't be talking to the universe. Those who are not on talking terms with their neighbors, talk to the universe <laughs> Right. Now, say, you know, in a… in a… in today's competitive world or uh, where people really think that you need to uh, cut… you know, there's cutthroat competition and you're working towards it and then there's negativity and say if someone is… For example, I'll take an example of myself, I believe in completely just working towards your goal and being positive about it and not looking around on what's happening or what people are doing. So my question is that is… so this, there's a certain positive energy that is… To, that, that you are surrounded with. Does negative energy… Is, does negative energy really affect a positive energy like, you know, people talk about evil eye or drishti that in our Indian culture is… is so much… which I don't believe in personally, but you know, you hear from your uh, relatives or people around that if you've done a good job, there's drishti, you know, you should come and do this puja and there are rituals that are followed. So, so can a negative energy harm a positive energy? See, uh, <coughs> instead of looking at this as positive energy and negative energy, the same energy can function positively or negatively. What is… if something works favorably for me, I say it's positive, if it is work works as a detriment, I say it's negative, but it is not essentially negative or positive. It may be what is darkness for you is light for a whole lot of creatures on this planet, isn't it? Electricity is right now doing positive things to us, so if you stick your finger into it, it does something else to you. It is still positive as far as the… you touch the positive only, not the negative <laughs> So, what it does is simply dependent upon variety of things the way it arranges itself. So, is there something like you are uh, surrounded by some negativity which affects your body, mind, energy, everything? Yes, there is. <laughs> this is something, uh, you know, uh, just three, four days ago, they were giving me the studies they have done in the… In our yoga center, we have a rejuvenation center. We have called… we have what is called as Klesha Nashana Kriya. Sorry, what is it called? Klesha Nashana Kriya, that means a Kriya which destroys impurities. To put it simply, few of them knew what to do, maybe previous generation knew gradually, they just started doing like this. But if you observe a person and do it in the right way, it does certain things. So we have a whole scientific process. How to do this? Just the same thing. See, it, today let's say you're very exhausted or… Let, rejuvenates yes, you Yes, rejuvenates you in some sense. So this is a water wash. Similarly, we can do wind wash, we can do fire wash, we can do substance wash like with grains and other things we can do. So what this is, is like a fire wash, but it needs to be done in a certain way. Water can touch our body, water can touch our skin, there's no problem. Fire cannot touch your skin, it needs to be done in a certain way. They give me this study report which is amazing. There is a, you know, a record of children who have come with this ADD and these kind of problems. Twenty-one Kleshanashanas, they're completely free of medication and fine. No medicine, no any kind of treatment, nothing. Just fire wash twenty-one times in twenty-one days and they come out clean and no medication, nothing, they're fine after that. 
There are any number of records. I was just looking at this four days ago and it's amazing. But this all our grandmothers wanted to do, they did not just do. I remember many times, when I came home from outside somewhere as a little kid, my mother would look at me and say, I think you need drishti we must take. I said, come on, rubbish, I don't want any drishti. <laughs> but she wouldn't let me, she would make… you know, I would be running around, she'll… still she would be doing yeah. something. I don't know whether it worked or not, I was too… <laughs> whatever mentally, too against all those things. But today there is proper record of what it does to people, tremendous things it's doing to people. So that means it does exist? It where... does, I mean there's no question about it, it does. The question is, do you know how to do it properly? We are thinking of… Uh, after six, uh, looking at this, I spoke to the people who are doing it and said we must give large-scale training to people. We must even produce videos and put it out so that everybody knows how to do it in their homes. Because this is such a simple thing that anybody can do at home and it has tremendous impact. So it's… so that means it's that simple for someone to just put drishti on someone and then they suffer? Like say in terms of ailment or you know like they think take off drishti, say suppose I don't believe in it at all. And I believe, like same, like you said, your mother would run around you like, uh, and you didn't believe in it. I don't believe in it and I feel that if you're a good person, these things can't harm you. If you're doing your things the right way, uh, how well, can someone… Well, I want you to know a lot of good people go through works in this world. Sorry, go through? A lot of good people go through terrible works in this world. Yeah. This is not a movie, this is real life, yeah. where a lot of good people suffer like hell. Isn't it? Right. This brings to the first thing that that means good things don't always happen to good people. Oh, not at all. <laughs> because… <laughs> Unfortunate. I must tell you this, a lady was driving in Minnesota. She had a flat tire and she got out. She had never handled a flat tire. Have you ever? Uh, no. No? <laughs> no. Once when my driver was with me, so I was… <laughs> I was okay <laughs> So she had never handled it. She was in a party clothes with high heels. She struggled, she put the jack lifted. She was terrified because she had parked in front of a mental asylum and there were all kinds of strange sounds coming from inside. So with great nervousness, she somehow took out the wheel, unbolted, took out the wheel, then she got the heavy, you know, uh, the spare tire, she got it out of the car with great difficulty carrying. She had put the four nuts in a hubcap. You know, these days there are no hubcaps, they used to be hubcaps. And uh, tottering around on her high heels, she stepped on the hubcap and these four nuts flew in four different directions. Now she did not know what to do, no nuts, how to fix the wheel. She just stood there dejected. Then from the third floor of the mental asylum, a young man who was there called her, Hey lady! She looked up terrified. He said, See, take out one one nut from the other three wheels and fix this wheel. With this you can easily drive to the next gas station and there you can fix it up. She did just that, then she looked up at him in gratitude and this she said, you are a, such a smart young man, why are you in this place? He said, I may be crazy, I'm not stupid <laughs> So, people may be good but they're stupid. Stupidity you pay. Stupid means just this. There are many levels of stupidity, but the worst kind of stupidity is just this. Your own thought and your own emotion doesn't take instructions from you. Tell me, it's your choice. You can either label yourself crazy or stupid. Your own thought. See, if it so happens, my hand stands slapping me. Somebody comes to do something to me, I can take care of it. If my hand starts slapping me, what is the solution? You're just crazy. <laughs> yes, you get slapped all the time. So most of the time, this is all that's happening to people is their own thought and their own emotion that's freaking them all the time. Who else is poking you? <laughs> when was the last time somebody poked you with a dagger? Hello? 
When was the last time? Nobody ever poked you, huh? You know, she's saying, no, even if you're in politics, nobody poked you <laughs> But you are busy poking yourself all the time. So it's up to you to choose the label, you're either stupid or crazy. None. <laughs> Would want to choose none. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, my next question is about astrology, as to… <laughs> as All to this time you're talking about taking charge of your destiny. No, I, that's why I want to know <laughs> that is it, is it, is, does it really ex I mean, how, to what percent is it actually relevant, is it true, can people really tell your future? Because I am somebody, if somebody says, you can't do this and I really want to do that, I'm like, Hell yeah, I'm gonna change it and I'm gonna be able to do it, whether it's… it's my work or my workspace or whatever. So, how much of astrology is true? How much of people can predict your future? Is it true that we are born with, you know, a certain um, life that people predict? You have a horoscope? I do, which I've never read, <laughs> but they say a lot of things. I said a horoscope. Horoscope? Yeah. No. <laughs> it's a horoscope because <laughs> if it's already written what you could do and could not do, your life is a horror. True. <laughs> Isn't There's it? There's no excitement in life then. It's not about excitement. There's no potential. Right. It's already written. You're not a potential life. You're a past life. We could have just framed the horoscope and bury you. Right. Instead of framing your picture after you die, we can frame the horror scope and bury you today. What is the problem? Is anyway the same thing? Because once you're past, it is just this, that which people remember about you, either it's written or in their minds, like a story. So there's no science to it. No, we'll come to that. There is some. See, every object especially if it's a large object like a planet or a star, it is exuding its own reverberation. Right now, this vessel is exuding its own reverberation, believe me, it is. Scientifically, we can prove this, that it is exuding a certain level of reverberation. Right now, it contains water, so it is exuding one kind of reverb. Suppose we put milk in it, it will be exuding another kind of reverb. Suppose I put… pour some mercury in it, it will exude something totally different. So every object, every physical form has its own reverberation. Now, if I don't have an established way of being, now this vessel could slowly influence me. To such an extent, many people, they touch a vessel and after that they can't keep it down. Don't… don't literally take a vessel. Many objects, they touch it and after that they can't keep it down, isn't it? Because without the reverberation of that, they cannot exist in many ways. So when this is the case, a planet could have its own reverberation. Now, it is up to me whether this vessel will determine my destiny or I will decide the destiny of this vessel is up to me because, I'll ask you a simple question, between inanimate objects and human consciousness. Which do you think is of a superior dimension of function? Of course. Of course, human being, isn't it? In a way, this is also a piece of the planet, it's just earth, isn't it? It's just the soil. Either we get it now or one day we'll get it from the maggots, but it is the soil. But here it reverberates in a certain way because it's conscious, it's intelligent, it's many things, very brainy. <laughs> hey, you got a certificate, I don't have, so I'm using it. You have a certificate from the world, <laughs> everyone's here listening to you. <laughs> so, this is conscious, this should determine the nature and the destiny of the inanimate object. When I say inanimate object, what you call as a planet, all the nine, eleven planets are also inanimate. Yes, they're big, but they're inanimate. The stars that you're talking about also are inanimate, and many of the stars that you believe are there are not there, actually. 
Yes, many of them are actually not there. They died long term ago because it takes light years for the light to reach you. You think it is there but they gone many million years ago <laughs> So, inanimate objects should decide the destiny of human consciousness or human consciousness should determine the destiny of inanimate objects, which way it should be. This should decide, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But right now a whole lot of people are allowing inanimate objects to decide their destiny. They definitely have an influence, will you allow it or not is the question. Do you know that uh, on full moon nights and no, no moon nights, we are on the coastal city, the waves are coming up, tides. Do you also know people if they are psychologically disturbed, on those days they become much more disturbed? Yes? I'm asking you, this is between you and me. Do you go crazy on full moon nights? No. No? I never go crazy <laughs> I find it so hard. So that means the full moon which has such a big influence on the ocean, such a big influence on that person who is mentally fragile has no influence on you? So the thing is whether you are going to allow it to influence you or will you influence it is the question. Full moon is only rising certain things within you. If the whole ocean is rising, obviously all the fluids in our body including our blood and everything else, you know all the gland secretions, everything is rising. It doesn't create madness. If you're little crazy, it'll make you more crazy. If you're joyful, it'll make you more joyful. If you're loving, it'll make you more loving. Whatever you are, it enhances you a little bit because it's pushing it up. Over seventy percent of this body is fluid, isn't it? So if the ocean is rising, is nothing rising? Definitely something is rising. So full moon day means in this country, full moon days and new moon days were the real holidays because it has something to do with our life. On that day you go to the temple, on that day you meditate, on that day you spend with the family, all kinds of things. This was important. We took away that science because our bodies and our existence is very deeply linked with the solar system, the way it functions. But will we ride the cycle or will we be crushed by the cycle? This is a choice that we have. If you learn to ride it, it'll be fantastic. If you don't learn, of course they'll crush you. So it's all about the willpower and the internal… Uh, conscious, being conscious. She's saying we have spoken enough <laughs> Oh, okay. She's saying we have only twenty minutes left. Okay. So she wants me… yeah, she wants me to wrap it up right now <laughs> No, I'm kidding <laughs> um, yeah, so, 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 so I suddenly… Br my chain of thought went there, should I do the audience question, should I ask, ask one mm -hmm. last question? Um, but, but my last question, Sadhguru, would be, you know, it, whenever I'm, anyone talking to you or listening to your speeches or, or following you, or me for example also, feels that life is really simple, you know, and it's beautiful and it's… it's it's full of love everywhere, we are love, things around us are… exude love, you know, things around us have life. But how difficult is it for people to understand that life is simple and why do you think the smallest of the things have been complicated by human race so much, be it relationships, be it marriages, be it love, be it work, there's just so much superficial things overcoated. Um, and people are just missing out on small joys of life and they just don't live life the way it's supposed to be. What is it that you would say would be step one for everyone to start at least looking into that direction of feeling that life is beautiful? Life is neither beautiful nor ugly, nor is it love nor hate. It is just that you can be beautiful within yourself, or you can be ugly, you can be loving or you cannot be loving. Everywhere love is exuding, no, this will take you to a la la land. No, I mean it's… it's nice, it's… you don't have to have conditions for… for… I mean everyone's lovely here 
I don't have a problem with anyone, but not everyone's going to look now, at it that way. Now I must tell you something. This happened. A young widow went to the cemetery to visit the grave that she was dedicated to, but she had a seven-year-old boy. That boy ran all over the cemetery reading all the inscriptions, he's just learned to read and write, so he's reading all the inscriptions all over. Then he came back to his mother after twenty, thirty minutes and said, Mama, where do they bury all the horrible people? Everybody is beautiful is not true. Then this is Lala Land, it's not true, people can be extremely ugly. But the, if you are beautiful, even that ugliness you can transform to whatever extent you can. Will everybody come your way? No, they will not. If they don't come your way, will you become ugly? No, that is the important thing. Right. When things don't happen your way, are you still capable of being a beautiful human being? That is all you have to fix. Right. If that one thing, if you fix, everything is fine. When nothing happens your way, are you still a beautiful human being? See, we must, you must understand this, this is the only thing that this culture has ever worshipped, I want you to understand. Since yesterday people have been reminding me of this because there is also a real estate issue today. <laughs> you know Rama is hugely worshipped, even today he is having property problems <laughs> yeah. He had continuous problems, young prince, grew up well, well educated for those days, very balanced, nice young man, gets married to a young beautiful princess. For some political reason, he has to leave his kingdom and go to the forest. I know in the movies, in the Rama Rao movies <laughs> and also Ramanan Sagar's television serial, Rama and Sita are in the forest and all romance and all this. That's not how it works in the jungle. I have lived in the jungle by myself alone for weeks on end. When I used to come back after two, three weeks in the jungle, even my parents wouldn't recognize me, they would look at me, what has happened to this guy? Because insect bites all over and your face is swollen and it's a different thing. Living in the jungle is not fun. Yeah. It is fun if you enjoy it, I did, but it's not easy on your system. So this young princess, she's not Adivasi or something, she's a princess. Taking her and living in the jungle is not some romantic story, it's a hard thing. The idea of sending him to the jungle is so that he must suffer, isn't it? Right. As if that was not enough, the Sri Lankan people came and kidnapped her. <laughs> from where? From Uttar Pradesh, huh? <laughs> not here. From Uttar Pradesh, they steal his wife and go away. He is a king, he could have found some local solution <laughs> for himself. But his wife means so much to him, he follows all the way, walking all the way down, no airplane to fly, walked all the way, the kidnapper had a plane <laughs> all right <laughs> But he had no airplane, he walked all the way, fought a battle and then burned down a beautiful city, somehow took his wife back and went home. She became pregnant. For a king, his wife becoming pregnant is very important because he has an empire, he needs a son, all these things are there. But at that time again some political issue happens, then he has to send his wife away to the jungle. No sonogram. <laughs> he does not know whether she is bearing boys or girls or what, Two boys come, he does not know. Then he fights a battle with those two boys without knowing they are his sons. For most human beings in their life, if anything truly horrible has to happen, knowingly or unknowingly they kill their own children, that is the worst thing that can happen to them, isn't it? He almost did it, not knowing, he almost killed both his boys. And then his dear wife, obviously she's dear to him, otherwise he wouldn't have followed all the way down. His dear wife dies in the jungle and he never sees her in his life. This is not a success story, isn't it? But even in recent times, 
during the independence uh, for, you know, freedom struggle, Mahatma Gandhi went on referring to Ramaraj. Because in this culture, one of the best administrations ever has been Rama's administration, how he administered his nation. So, when all this extreme drama was happening in his life, worst kind of drama is happening in his life, this guy never married again. He lived alone, he almost fought his… killed his own children, complete disastrous life. But he remained balanced and did his administration and whatever work he has to do with such balance and efficiency that after five, six thousand years, when we talk about a ideal nation, we say Ram Raj. Right. So, the essential thing is this, whatever the drama, however bad it is, every deal is bad, what happened in his life, if one of those things happened to most people, they'll crack up. Yeah. One of those things, serial disaster. But he is doing everything to the best of his ability that he can do in the given moment and fulfilling his duties, whatever he has to do. So it is that freedom that he has from his drama that's happening around him, absolutely free. This is mukti. As he's alive, it's jivan mukti. As he's alive, he is free. It is that freedom that we are bowing down to, not his being a king or a god or whatever, because the man remained free of the extreme drama that was continuously happening around him. And now we can take questions from the audience. You're in the movies, but I have more drama going around me all the time <laughs> <laughs> We only act that there's drama on screen. <laughs> Yes. There's, there's someone there. No, no, there's someone standing there. He raised his hand. Do we send a mic there? Namaskaram Sadhguru. Namaskaram Sadhguru. I have a question. Before the question. Can't hear. Okay. Before the question, I has to share my experience for a minute. No, 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 just stick to the question. There's very oh. little time. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, fine. And I have a sometimes my longing for the enlightenment or to touch the peak of life, it bubbles up sometimes and it goes too high. I got tears in my eyes and then it just shut down and it normal, normals again. And my question is how to keep that longing constantly high uh, so that continuously I can touch the peak of my life. He's asking you. You're asking me? He's, you're asking… <laughs> I, I was trying to… The, the audio is not that clear, he's asking you obviously. No. <laughs> this, so, uh, see every human being, every human being, even if you take those human beings who you think are the most miserable sort, even they have their moments of joy, otherwise they wouldn't be alive. Yes or no? There's not a single moment of joy in their life, they would have taken their life long time ago. There is joy, but they are also manufacturing misery. So this is something you must understand. People think, Love, joy, ecstasy are happening to them. Once you make this mistake, you also start thinking, misery, frustration, anxiety, depression is happening to you. No, you are doing it to yourself. You can do either joy to yourself or misery to yourself, agony to yourself or ecstasy to yourself. If you want to know how to do what you want with this, Do you agree with me? I'm… I'm speaking technically today because <laughs> if I speak poetry, it will be misunderstood. If you speak philosophy, it will go all over the place. <laughs> Technicality, technology is something that you cannot distort at least. <laughs> Do you agree with me that this human mechanism is the most sophisticated mechanism on this planet? Huh? Do you? Yeah. Not your new iPhone? No <laughs> This eye is far more sophisticated than anything. I'm asking you, 
Have you read the user's manual, sir? No, you're an accidental user. You, if you're an accidental user, how will it work? By accident it'll work. Once in a way, tears of ecstasy came. Next moment depression came. Obviously you're accidental, isn't it? From ecstasy, if you at least came down to bliss, <laughs> all right, some slow down, we can gas it up. From ecstasy to misery means what? You're accidental. Your joys are accidental, your misery is accidental. <laughs> when over ninety-nine percent of everything that you're doing right now, the four dimensions of karma are accidental, how will you ever sustain anything? There is nobody here who do not know joy. Their only problem is it's not sustainable, isn't it? So if I teach you a simple method with which you can create a chemistry of blissfulness, are you ready? Once in how many days will you do it? Every day. Hello? <laughs> he doesn't know. It's okay, I know how many… once in how many days he will do it. Because I've been teaching for thirty-five years now, I know once in how many days they will do it. Today I can show you millions of people around the world. For me, not a single day passes without me witnessing tears of love and ecstasy. Somebody around me will be shedding tears of love and ecstasy, wherever I go, whichever part of the world. I… you know, the first time, I went to Moscow. When I get down at the airport, a bunch of people are standing there with all tears. I said, when did this happen to the Russians? I never came here <laughs> said, no Sadhguru, we've been watching your videos and they don't understand English. Some Russian guy that we don't know is translating and putting it on, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and they're all standing there at the airport crying. Why I'm saying this is, this is not some magic. This is a little bit of engineering yourself. One man's magic is another man's engineering. If five hundred years ago, if I flew, you would think I'm a magician, isn't it? Today you say I'm a pilot, yes or no? So similarly, somebody being miserable, somebody being ecstatic is not by fortune and misfortune. Somebody is handling this right, somebody is not handling it right, that's about it. I'm here, alive, still going around doing things. This is the time to learn and make it happen for yourself that you learn to engineer this the way you want it. If you like misery, I have no issue. I won't seek your company, that's all. Yeah. If you like misery, I will not deny to you. I'm not telling you everybody must be ecstatic, be whatever you want. If that's what you want, that's what you should be. But you want to be in pleasant states, but you're in unpleasant states, you better fix yourself, isn't it? <laughs> Other question there. Can we have a mic sent there, please? Oh, Mystic One, what is your take on time travel? Oh. <laughs> I thought my number was different. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> time travel, I think I already spoke about it and uh, this idea of time and space comes to you because you're working within certain limitations, functioning within certain limitations. See, in the yogic way of looking at things, generally how modern physics also is moving towards this direction at a very top level, but generally the textbooks physics that you read in the high school says because there is distance, because there is space, it takes certain amount of time to get there. Isn't… isn't this how you understand? Now from here you have to drive to your home. Because there is distance, because there is two kilometers, it will take so many minutes. No, that's not how creation is. Because there is time, there is distance doesn't make any logical sense to you because time is of two different types. 
the way you know the time right now, you understand the time because something here is going in cyclical moments. You understand what is a day, what is a night, what is today, what is tomorrow, simply because the planet spun once. Or if it… If the moon goes around, we say it's a month. If the planet goes around the sun, we say it's a year. Essentially, your understanding of time is cyclical in nature. Anything that moves cyclically, by that you come to the understanding what time it is by counting that. Suppose nothing was cyclical, how would you know time? But still there was… Be, there would be time, isn't it? So in your experience right now, only cyclical dimension of the physical seems like time to you because your whole experience of life right now is limited to your physical nature in the sense. You know life only by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching, isn't it? If you could not see, hear, smell, taste or touch right now, you would have no experience of life, either of what's around you or even yourself. It happens to you when you fall asleep that you are not seeing, you are not hearing, you are not smelling, you are not tasting, you are not touching, neither the world exists nor you exist. But if you transcend that limitation that you do not see, hear, smell and taste but you are still there, if this happens to you, you would understand what I am telling you, that time is fast. Because there is time, there is space. So what happens, the time that you know due to the cyclical movements is called kala in India. Kala, kala, kal. The Hindi people cut everything into kal. It's kala or kalam. So what is kala also means darkness. Space is always dark, isn't it? We are using the same word to represent both time and space because space is born out of time. And you understand time only because of the cyclical nature. But if you know time, which is beyond cyclical movements of whatever, physical entities, then we say you know Mahakala, a greater time which is not of cyclical nature. So if you touch this dimension called Mahakal or Mahakala, in Tamil we are Mahakalam, <laughs> if you touch that dimension, then there is no time for you. It's not that you travel in time, there's simply no time for you. There's no such thing as time for you. Everything is here and now. Any other questions? I think. This is the last question. Get this lady, one of the girls too. Okay. Who do we take? You pick. It's up to you. <laughs> Hello, Sadhguru. Hello, where? Oh, somebody. Here, uh, this, uh, straight to you. Oh, there, right yeah, there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, good evening. How are you? Uh, right side, Sadhguru. Yeah. There. Standing. Third row. Okay. From the One bottom. With the okay, green okay, 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 okay. You just have to wave your hand, then we will figure out. I did raise Regard my it. hand. No, no, that's fine. Hi. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, Sadhguru, my question is to you uh, Is dharma definite? If it is not, does it uh, make an individual opportunist? Well, we went to from karma to dharma now. See, the problem with this country is, there was a time when every generation produced thousands of enlightened beings, realized beings, sages and seers and mystics were all over the place. So, the vocabulary of the most profound became vocabulary of daily usage also. Because of this, people are always throwing these words around – mukti, moksha, prarabdha, karma, dharma, this one, that one, everything – without understanding the full depth of what they're uttering. Simply, loosely it is being thrown around. Now the same words are being picked up by the West – karma, dharma, everything is becoming part of English lexicon <laughs> So when we say dharma, we are talking about 
the word dharma literally means law, not religion. So we said, you have definitely heard, even in the political circles, they've been using Raj dharma, this dharma, that dharma, this is a dharma for the husband, dharma for the children, dharma for the wife, dharma for the raja, dharma for the preja. They're just talking about unwritten laws that all of us should follow for conducive function of a society. And Atma Dharma, they said, Dharma are the laws which govern our inner nature. So these are laws, these are not morals, these are not ethics, these are laws. When we say a law, we're talking about… in the… in science we're using this word law, that is appropriate way of dharma. Now the dharma is, if I take this flower, though it is a flower, light and beautiful, if I drop it, it'll only go down. This is the law of gravity. We can say this is the dharma of this bhumi, that if you drop something, it'll go only down, it'll not go up. This is the bhumi dharma. So they spoke in their own language of the time. So dharma essentially meant a law, not some kind of a policy or religion or anything else. Today slowly it's become like this, dharma means it's becoming a religion. When we said sanatana dharma, we are talking about eternal laws. If you say eternal law, obviously these are laws not about physical nature but about inner nature. So the laws that govern our inner nature are eternal laws. It can't be yours or mine, it is the nature of the universe. It is the nature of the life that is here. It is not that it belongs to any one community or the other, it is the very nature of life and existence. So, if you are in tune with the laws, you will fly. If you are in not in tune with the laws, you will get stuck. A simple thing. Right now, this is being taught to everybody in the management schools, everywhere in the homes also, you must make your mark in the world, then the planet will be all dented by the time you leave <laughs> With the kind of population we <laughs> have for sure <laughs> Yes, you must leave your footprint and go. You must understand those who leave footprints shall never fly in their life. This is the law. <laughs> we'll leave it here <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I'm sure… Uh, Madam is the have, boss. I'm sure you must have enjoyed uh, this session as much as we have enjoyed bringing it to you. We thank uh, Rakul Preet and Sadhguruji for this uh, thoughtful exploration. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here.
ಪುರಾ ಹಿಚಾ ಪುರದಿ ಜೀವನ ಆಶಾ 